Midnight Facts for Insomniac. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. But at the same time, he basically told them, if you don't let me use your city and your resources, I'm going to kill you all. And so, I guess they did the math, and as we'll see, they forgot to carry a two. <laughs> Their math left something to be desired. There were some X's and V's left off the <laughs> mathematical table, yes. Hey, Duncan. Yo! I haven't done that for a while. Ever. Yeah. I feel like I underplayed it. I didn't even know you were going to do it. And I was like, yo. I sprang it on you. You weren't prepared. You couldn't really get it from your core. Yo. Yes. Slacking. It was was more of a surprised yelp. Yo. Yeah. (laughs) So this is part two. It's not really part two because it's not related to the last episode. Mm. But uh, the last episode was a tie, if you remember. We had a tie in the Discord poll. Yep. And uh, the first one was World's Fairs, which I actually really liked. I think that was a very cool episode. Very funny. So this episode, yes, we are focusing on historical sieges through the years. Huh. So it could be a castle, it could be a compound, it could be a house, it could be a town, a city, a fortification, anything where you had a bunch of people holed up and they were fighting off a larger force mm-hmm. or maybe a smaller force and they just didn't even want to bother. So they just closed the doors. They were like, no, we're not going to, mm, <laughs> we refuse to engage. Mm-hmm. Talk to the drawbridge. <laughs> You do have to have something. You got to right. have something in between you and them. Yes. That's the important thing. And Generally uh, walls. Yes. It that. could be walls, but it could be a moat. It mm. could be fire. Mm. <laughs> there are a lot of things. <laughs> Hard to keep something burning for months, I find. I, uh, You know, whatever works. Yeah. I'm just saying. Get mm. creative. And some of these sieges are kind of creative. This was fun. I got to look into a bunch of different historical scenarios. Fair enough. So the word siege itself comes from the Latin sedere, which is to sit, as in like have a seat outside our walls and get comfortable. It's going to be a while. <laughs> Sieges are rarely short. Yes. Especially the really interesting ones kind of went on forever. Was, you know, if it's two hours, it's not really a siege. That was more like a speed bump. That was just a pause. It just delayed the inevitable for two seconds. Yeah. There's no real definition for a siege, but a siege is basically what you get. Well, there probably is. I don't know. I didn't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is a definition. <laughs> no one really knows. It's impossible to, to define. Tell, right? really. <laughs> Sieges are a mystery. <laughs> End of episode. <laughs> Obviously, I do a ton of research. I did look this up. But my point is that regardless of what the dictionary says, there is no definition in the sense that there's no one single template for a siege. But in general, a siege is what you get when one side of the conflict has a very strong defensive position. Mm. Usually when they're holed up in, like, as we mentioned, a fortress or an island or some other protected or fortified location. And they decide that their best strategy is to weaponize boredom. (laughs) It is the warfare equivalent of a staring contest. Sieges can last days, months, years, or decades, and the result generally comes down to whichever side has more patience and resources. So the army outside of the walls or fortifications is betting that the occupants of the fortress will run out of food or water or experience some type of illness outbreak. That's something that can happen in, you know, small quarters with a lot of people. Or maybe they'll have a mental breakdown just based on pure claustrophobia. Or, you know, they'll run out of playing cards and get sick of marathon sessions of Monopoly and charades. Yeah. By the 5,000th round of rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> thrill of competition has worn thin. <laughs> you have to add all new implements. Seriously. You're actually using rock, paper, and scissors. <laughs> yeah. Because you're running out of food, too, so you just go eat the motherfucker across from you. <laughs> so sieges typically have two possible outcomes. The most dramatic is a win for the attacking team when the fortifications are breached and the city or castle or whatever is sacked. There's usually not a lot of mercy offered in that situation because the longer a siege has dragged on, the more resentment and frustration has typically built up in the minds and hearts of the attackers. Right. So the act of surrounding a city or fortress and cutting off supply routes to try to starve out the occupants has an official military name. Hmm. That's called investment. Wow. The standard strategy is to implement an investment and then use projectile weapons like missiles, shells, or catapults, depending on the historical era. Mm to either wipe out the population or destroy the fortifications and gain entry. Yes. If you have cut off your enemy from all of their resources, that is known as complete investment. If you also then set fire to the fortress and simultaneously attack from all sides while adding shells and battering rams to the mix, that's considered a diversified investment. I I can't... This feels like a lie. These are... (laughs) These are lies. The complete investment is true. Yes. That part's true. Okay. Tactics for breaching a fort or fortress can include tunneling under walls... 
hammering the defenses with battering rams or other brute force implements, and of course scaling fortifications with ladders and siege towers, which were tall wooden structures covered with animal skin and used to elevate the attackers to the same level as the defenders and negate the high ground advantage. Yes, also typically soaked with mud or water so that they would not catch a flame. Correct, and they would usually be pushed up to the walls of the fortress or the city, and then a gangplank would be dropped down to allow attackers to pour in over the walls. Yes, if anyone's having trouble visualizing this, just watch Lord of the Rings, the first three movies. It's the one in the middle. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good depiction of a cool siege. Not a realistic one, but Mm. not too many orcs in history, but (laughs) it was still very dramatic. Truly. Those giant siege implements, like uh, siege towers and trebuchets, they were too large and unwieldy to be transported more than a couple hundred yards at a time, so they typically had to be built on site Mm. with any materials available. You mentioned that sometimes these could catch fire. That's because they were typically rickety and made of wood. These were not super high-tech devices. These were kind of slapdash. Yeah. Think scaffolding with bare steps in them. And thus, they were vulnerable to counterattacks and fire. Flame was one of the most effective weapons for both sides in a siege, but especially for the attackers. A fortress could have all the resources in the world and be prepared to hold out for months, but one guy falls asleep on his mattress with a lit cigarette, and it's game over. So, of course, tossing flaming items over the walls of a fortress was a favored tactic, unless it's wintertime, in which case you're probably just helping them out. Yeah. (laughs) I'm so cold, mummy. Well, we're just going to wait for the attackers to throw us a nice little campfire, aren't we? Because the seasons could also be weaponized. Yes. Some cities or fortresses could last easily through like three quarters of the year with no problem. They had plenty of resources, but then they would be decimated by a brutal winter. So it was just kind of a waiting game. Mm. So when your enemies are huddled together for warmth in the middle of a frozen tundra, maybe don't send flaming arrows over the walls to thaw them out. Yes. There's one other popular method to gain entry to a fortified location. Can you think of that? Uh, Deception. Oh. The most obvious example is the Trojan horse. But if you happen to be attacking a city that isn't full of gullible idiots, a more likely strategy was to try to convince someone on the inside to basically just unlock the door. Uh. Which isn't always as hard as it seems. As we've mentioned, life inside the besieged city or fort or fortress could be a tad bit uncomfortable. I mean, and also, let's just think about it. If you've been in there for a year or two and you're running out of fucking meat, your brain isn't working so good. So somebody outside being like, no, we've all left, mate. No, no, let me in. Mommy, I'm Steve. I was next to you in a farm. Yeah, let me in. The strategy of bamboozling. Yes. (laughs) Time tested. (laughs) We mentioned the boredom and claustrophobia and the constant paranoia that results from being surrounded by a hostile force for months at a time. Yeah. So you can imagine there were plenty of occupants of these sieges who were slightly less than committed to the cause or became slightly less committed over time. Yes. So many occupants of besieged castles or fortresses were potentially willing to bargain via passing notes through walls or using, I don't know, body language or just winking suggestively. I don't, I don't know how it worked, but... Flashing your boobs in Morse code. Who knows? Whatever it takes mm-hmm. to get the fuck out of there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> this is, I'm sure, before, you know, open latrines were a thing. Wait. Ooh, we'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So a siege tends to be a showcase for engineers and construction workers. It's all about the power of building. Often the attacking army would create their own fortifications to defend them from counterattacks by allies of the enemy, basically a fortified line of defense on the perimeter of a giant circle surrounding the entire conflict. So this is known as circumvallation, and they might also build another smaller circle of spikes or wooden stakes or barbed wire or whatever facing inward toward the siege target in case of counterattacks from within the fortress. So you ended up with layers of concentric defenses. It got very intricate. Yeah, it sounds like you also got layers of concentric siege. And also the people coming to your aid are not really helping at that point. It's like, look, we just we would like to get out of here right. eventually, <laughs> and you're just locking us in even more. Yes. So as previously mentioned, sieges can involve massive cities with giant dueling armies, or they can just consist of a small group of defenders taking refuge in a, in a compound or a little house, just anywhere where you can make your stand. As long as you have solid DoorDash, you're good. For instance, in 1304, after the defeat of William Wallace, which many of you probably recognize from the completely fictitious movie Braveheart, mm. which Duncan thoroughly debunked in the Scottish host swap episode, uh, after William Wallace and the Scottish Rebellion had mostly been mopped up by the Brits, their last stand occurred at Stirling Castle, when 30 Scottish defenders held out for approximately four months against over 1,500 English attackers. I mean, 30? Against 1,500? You are angry at that point. If there's 1,500 of you and 30 other guys, you're just mad. 
Well, they probably didn't know how many were in there. It's just a castle. You know, the guys you see might just be the tip of the spear. <laughs> now go away or I will taunt you a second time. The castle was at the top of a large hill and featured many of the ingredients required for a successful siege defense. So they had their own internal well for fresh water. That's very important. Mm. And stores of salted meat and fish, as well as sacks of grain, etc. It was, you know, it was enough for a party. Yeah. And presumably bagpipes for entertainment. <laughs> or just to annoy the enemy. <laughs> to keep the enemy from encroaching on the castle. You play the bagpipes all night, they will keep their distance. Those bastards have been playing that blasted bagpipes all night for five weeks. It's a strategy for taunting and also uh, repelling. Yeah. yeah, early psych warfare. Mm -hmm. Presumably they also stored large quantities of scotch in order to tolerate the isolation and also to tolerate the bagpipes. I mean, it does help. But of course, surviving a siege is not just a matter of stocking up on resources. You also have to have all of those fortifications, the walls and towers and parapets and the little tiny slitted windows mm -hmm. through which you can poke a gun or a bow or, or just toss rocks or dirt or even spit at the enemy or urinate on them. That's if you're really confident you're going to win or really confident you're going to lose. It's one of the two. It's like, I'm going to die anyway. I'm yeah. peeing on you. I'm R. Kelly the shit out of you, sir. And, of course, you want to have plenty of hot oil to pour on defenders who try to scale your walls and also to pour on your naughty bits for copious masturbation sessions because, as we pointed out, lots of free time. Yes. And also, I've learned that is actually a myth because if you have hot oil, you're not going to boil it. You're not going to throw it on the enemy. If anything, you're keeping that so that you can light your way or do other things with the oil that are useful. You're not dumping it on them. You could just mm -hmm. boil water. Yeah. Well, none of these sieges actually feature any uh, boiling oil, so you might be right. One of them, however, does feature uh, boiling hot sand, which was poured over, and we'll talk about that. Yep. But all of that preparation still might not be enough, depending on the strength of your enemy. In the case of Stirling Castle, the attacking British army built the largest trebuchet ever created, called the War Wolf. E. A trebuchet is just a giant catapult. In general, the difference is that catapults hurl small objects over walls and trebuchets hurl big objects into walls. Yes. There are also mangonels. They use the tension of a twisted taut cable to provide thrust as opposed to just the heavy counterweight and gravity method used by trebuchets. Right. So trebuchets are basically, think of a long-ass pole, huge amount of weight on one side, and then you lock the other side down, you load it up with whatever, and you know the other side's, the, the first side's weight is much heavier, and that flings it over the side. The um, mangolins or mangaloids or whatever the hell, um, those are the classical catapults that we think of when you, they see something winding something up. Mm. They have tension. Yeah. So after furious bombardment by the war wolf... Stirling Castle surrendered, and I'm sure the British were very proud of themselves for their hard-won victory over 30 starving Scots. Yeah. It must have been a little awkward when they finally got in there. They were like, really? This is... Oh. <laughs> mm. We spent... Uh, Quite a bit of time outside. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So the challenges facing a besieged castle or fort or city are not just about replenishing resources. There's also the matter of disposing of waste. Mm. In the days before modern plumbing, restrooms were basically just big piles of excrement that needed to be hauled out of the city, and very few attacking armies are going to be polite enough to allow for occasional shit runs. <laughs> if they were smart, maybe they would, <laughs> because defending armies frequently did exactly what you might expect and flung their excrement over the walls. Right. But turnabout is fair play, and it was just as common for the attackers to use catapults and trebuchets to rain down feces from above. This is actually a really effective technique if you think about it. You just bombard a fort or castle with human waste, and the idea of surrender starts to seem a lot more appealing. I mean, if it's just not the smell, disease is rife. Yeah, excrement warfare was not rare. Human waste has been weaponized throughout history. Mm. Quote, in 12th century China, a slightly more advanced version of the shit catapult was used, which Stephen Turnbull writes about in his snappily titled book, Siege Weapons of the Far East. The weapon, which the author calls an excrement trebuchet bomb, was a type of explosive device made from hemp string and filled with gunpowder, human shit, and poison, which was lit with a hot poker before being flung at the enemy, unquote. Imagine being the klutzy fuck who lit it a little too early and that blows up. That's the end of your career, if not your life. When they talk about things blowing up in your face, yeah, that's oh. not one of the things you want blowing up in your face. Ever. This strategy has also been implemented on a smaller scale. Quote, Alexander Georgievich Semenov, a Russian inventor with approximately 200 patents to his name, filed a patent in 2009 that was titled Method of Biowaste Removal from Isolated Dwelling Compartment. 
which in non-patent title terms is a device that would allow tanks to fire human shit. Unquote. Give <laughs> fucking what? When? Is this a shit show? So yeah, the strategy was, you know, get rid of the feces and also obviously embarrass and uh, potentially harm the enemy. Yeah. It's win-win. Except for, you know, only two wins for you. Yeah. No wins for them. <laughs> If you think about it, that's basically just biological warfare. Yeah. Excrement is aesthetically and aromatically unappealing, but even more effective from a warfare standpoint, as you mentioned, it is also tremendously unsanitary and carries disease. Mm. And weaponized disease has a long and storied history of military application. In our plagues episode, we talked about the common practice of hurling fomites over the walls during sieges. Fomites are any inanimate object infected with disease and capable of transferring that infection via contact. The word also refers to counterfeit mites purchased on the black market. These are lies. Fomites. Yeah, no, I got it. F -A -F -A -U -X. <laughs> mites. I, I, how, how I have missed you explaining dumb jokes to me. <laughs> One common version of fomites consisted of the corpses of plague victims, which were lobbed over walls during the Black Death to infect defenders during sieges, and probably also to just make them generally queasy. Yeah, I, I think we talked about this in our we previous episode. It yeah, it's, yeah, it's just going to be nauseating, if not deadly. Yeah, just you. That yeah. is pretty demoralizing to have dead bodies raining down from above, also bearing disease. Yeah, I mean, especially if you knew them. So let's talk about some notable sieges throughout history. Yes, let's do. Back in the year 332 BC, the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, or maybe Tira, I don't know, Tira, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Sure was the jewel of the Phoenician civilization on the coast of modern-day Lebanon. It was also a strategic port, and Alexander the Great wanted to use it as a stronghold for his Macedonian army in their battle against the Persians. The problem for Alexander was that the Tyrians didn't want to get involved in his drama. Hmm. It was not their fight. My name is Paul. It's it between, between y'all. <laughs> that was their... General philosophy. Perspective. Yes. And they didn't feel any particular pressure to help because they didn't have to. Before Alexander's forces arrived, the women and children of Tyre had already evacuated to Carthage, while the men took refuge on an island, which is now a peninsula about a kilometer off the coast, fortified by 150-foot walls. Holy feck. It was a very well-defended sausage fest. A lot of dudes. <laughs> so Alexander's first strategy was to demand that he be allowed to use the temple on the island to make a sacrifice to Heracles, and he promised that if the inhabitants complied, they would be spared. The inhabitants, for their part, declined to voluntarily lower their defenses and invite a notorious mass murderer to borrow their temple. Weird. Also, that's the dumbest bamboozlement attempt I've ever heard. Why, yes, bring your legendary invading army into the heart of our fortified island and kill some things in our holiest structure. I'm sure you'll limit your murder to uh, to an ox. Yes, yeah. and then leave again. Yeah. With all of our lives intact. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. We, get, we didn't build 150 foot walls to be hospitable. Yeah. This, this is not a welcoming place. The fuck did you think was going to happen? Yeah. Also, I, I think the idea that Alexander's offer might have been on the level, it's kind of undermined by the fact that there was a perfectly serviceable temple in the old city, mm. the pre-island version of Tyre back on shore. But for some reason, Alexander didn't want to use the one that was less strategically located for his army. Alex just getting all bougie. Ew, that's the old one. I want the new one. It's got flashier things. Yeah, I don't know how he justified that. Mm. He was just like, have you met Heracles? He is very ex demanding. He has standards. <laughs> he says, pimp my temple. You pimp the temple. You've got 100 foot, 150 foot walls. This thing barely has a wall. Only the best for a non-existent figment of our collective imaginations. Religion isn't real. Once again, Miffy taking a firm stance on nope. But Alexander did not take the refusal kindly. Oh. You could say that he was miffed. Oh. He sent a delegation to try to change the minds of the Tyrians. The delegation was executed and tossed over the walls into the ocean. <laughs> your, your gesture is rejected, sir. That's a, that's a smidge too far. I mean, not really. When you're surrounded by an army and they're like, hey, so uh, want to come outside because our first try didn't work? You're like, no, fuck you. You're going to try and kill us. Uh, yeah, but you could just say no. Like, I, see, here's the thing. Like, I was on their side initially, mm. and now they've lost me because they killed a bunch of innocent messengers. Uh, and they have lost the support of a guy on a podcast 2,000 years later. Yeah, I was gonna... 
I was going to say, I'm sure it's hurting their metaphorical souls out there somewhere in limbo. I'm just saying, slaughtering unarmed messengers, that's not strategically nor morally defensible. That is my point. All right, fair. But what was defensible was the island city of Tyre. Yes. For a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. Alexander was stuck on the shore with over half a mile of ocean, plus those massive walls between him and his target. So his second strategic attempt at accessing the island was less diplomatic. He started building a causeway from the shore using dirt and silt and rubble from the old city. The water was reasonably shallow for the first stretch, and then the depth increased to around 20 feet. It was still manageable. Mm. But it's a little tough to build a bridge when there are Tyrians perched on 150-foot walls, tossing spears and arrows, and also probably insulting your mother and mooning the construction crew. It's just just demoralizing. I mean, to say nothing of tides and hurled shite and, you know, bones from their chicken or whatever the hell they were eating. Yeah, it's, it's not going to go well for whoever's making it. Alexander responded by constructing two siege towers at the end of the causeway and using them to return fire, which was moderately successful. Work was slow going, but it proceeded. Mm. At least it proceeded until the Tyrians switched tactics. They packed a wooden ship full of resin, sulfur, torches, and other flammable items, set the sails on fire, and launched it at the causeway. For good measure, they positioned cauldrons of oil at the top of the sails so that when the sails burned through, the cauldrons would topple and stoke the blaze into an inferno. Holy crap. Simultaneously, they sent soldiers to the causeway to fend off attempts to fight the fire, and much of the causeway and the siege towers were destroyed. Yikes. Minor setback. <laughs> Alexander was extra miffed. I was going to say, <laughs> I feel like telling the boss this particular fuck up... Mm. Yeah, now you've like killed his uh, delegation. First, you wouldn't let him use your temple. Right. Rude. And then you killed a bunch of people. Mm. Extra rude. <laughs> then you destroyed his causeway that he was trying to use to destroy you. Super rude. Like you've, you've graduated to ultra rude at this point. <laughs> These guys are just not willing to let themselves be murdered. And that's very inconvenient for what Alexander wanted to get accomplished, which was you know, murdering them. Murdering them, yes. Mostly Dick he material. just wanted to use their city. Right. They could have just left. They mm. could have honestly just walked out and he probably would have been fine and let them all go and then they would have had no city i mean they could have gone back to the old one i guess and just like you know but that was now rubble because he was using it to build the causeway <laughs> i'm not seeing a way out for them i'm actually no. still on team tier at this one i don't know i'm kind of agnostic about it because he wasn't really after them mm -hmm. like they decided to basically not let him use their city and resources and i get that they didn't want to be exploited, mm -hmm. but at the same time, he basically told them, if you don't let me use your city and your resources, I'm going to kill you all. And so I guess they did the math, and as we'll see, they forgot to carry a two. <laughs> Their math left something to be desired. There were some X's and V's left off the <laughs> mathematical table, yes. So Alexander doubled down on the construction of the causeway and simultaneously switched tactics by calling in naval reinforcements and initiating attacks also from the open ocean side of the island, the west, where the walls were not as high. Hmm. This marked the most grueling and almost comical stretch of the siege. This is just a bunch of, like, measures and countermeasures. It unfolded very much like a spy versus spy cartoon. E. So the Tyrians hurled giant stones into the water so that Alexander's approaching ships would be wrecked. Alexander then lassoed them and, like, was started towing them away one by one. Mm. Meanwhile, the Tyrians sent divers to cut the anchor ropes of Alexander's ships so that the vessels would constantly have to shuffle around in, like, endless maneuvers. Yeah. Alexander replaced the ropes with chains. It was just measures and countermeasures. Yeah. Escalation. The Tyrians next began pouring cauldrons of molten sand over the walls of the city, which carried on the wind and set both ships and soldiers ablaze, further miffing Alexander. You are running out of uses of myth, <laughs> sir, rather rapidly. We're moving beyond miffed at this point. Yeah. We're going to find another word. Enraged is coming rapidly in view, I feel. Unfortunately for the city of Tyre, these were just stalling tactics. Ultimately, it was becoming clear that the inhabitants of the island were just delaying the inevitable. This yeah. was not looking good. No. And so, increasingly desperate, the Tyrians decided to attempt a sneak attack. They observed that Alexander had a routine. Every day at approximately the same time, he and many of his men retreated to the shore for lunch. Well, yeah. I mean, toast points don't make themselves. You gotta have time, man. So the Tyrians hung up giant sails across their harbor to conceal their preparations and then dramatically whipped them aside as they launched a surprise lunchtime naval assault. <laughs> I love how they're in the middle of just imagining Alex eating his sandwiches like, hey, look at all the fucking sails. Those are new. Why the... Why the sails? Humph, yeah. Humph. How do they think this is going to work? Pay no attention to this giant curtain we have <laughs> right. 
hastily constructed. <laughs> we're airing out our laundry. You, what do you think? We, we've been stinking this place up for months now. Crushed by Alexander's superior naval forces, many of the Tyrians abandoned their sinking ships and literally swam back to the island. Hmm. And with most of these submerged giant stones finally towed away or hauled out of the water with crane ships, Alexander was now able to move his battering rams into position, and that was all she wrote. Hmm. Legend holds that Alexander himself participated in the final attack. At this point, it was personal. Yeah. Approximately 8,000 Tyrians were killed. Some 30,000 were enslaved. The entire siege had taken seven months, and that's a lot of time for resentment to build. Mm. So Alexander was super ornery. Mm. Yeah. He had achieved maximum miffage. <sighs> All right, man. That's your last one for the episode. <laughs> no more miffews. Oh, damn it. Postscript, the causeway that Alexander created would over time accumulate silt and sand and rubble and eventually became a permanent feature, turning the former island into the aforementioned current peninsula. Huh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Next siege. Next siege, please. You're probably asking yourself, what was the longest siege in history? Sure. <laughs> it was the siege of Ceuta, hmm. C-E-U-T-A, a Spanish city in northern Africa, which was attacked by Morocco in 1694, and the conflict lasted an exhausting 30 years. Fuck that noise. That is crazy. You're not even fighting the same people anymore. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the original defenders have died. Yeah, that is a war that is passed on to the next generation. Yeah. It's the shittiest inheritance ever. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the war, son. Um... I'm going to fuck off and die now. Some backstory. At the very northwest tip of Africa, the very tippy top off the shores of Morocco, mm. is the Strait of Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And if you cross that strait, you're in Spain. Mm. The hop from Spain to Africa is tiny. On a map, it looks like I could float it on an inner tube. It's just a little sliver. Mm -hmm. Probably probably couldn't, but that's how it looks. Gotcha. So Spain had sent colonizers across the strait and founded a city at that very northernmost tip, an extremely strategic port. In 1694, the Sultan Ismail bin Sharif of Morocco dreamed of building a powerful empire, and he charged one of his governors, Ali bin Abdallah, with taking the city. Hmm. I cannot say that name without hearing the Aladdin song <laughs> in my head. I feel like a horrible, basic bitch Caucasian guy. Yeah. But uh, Ali, fabulous, he, Ali, Ababa. Yeah, I feel bad. <laughs> when the initial attack failed, both sides dug in. Citizens of the city relied on food shipments from Spain through the Strait of Gibraltar, while the attackers settled down, built shelters, and grew fields of crops. They made themselves comfortable. <laughs> so these cities were less like opposing armies and more like bitchy neighbors. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this is not set up to be a siege, sir. This is just people separated by a wall waiting for the other to die. Yeah, surprised that after a couple decades, anyone even remembered what they were fighting about. Or that they were fighting. Like, yeah. So I'm not going to bother going through all the details of this one. There were tons of little skirmishes. It went on for 30 freaking years. Mm. There were no decisive blows struck, by which I guess you could say that ultimately the Spanish won. Mm. Winning a siege, if you're the defenders, it's not very dramatic. It's like being released from house arrest. You don't gain any riches or spoils of war. You just gain the ability to go on a hike. <laughs> Without, you know, being filled with arrows or hot sand yeah you could have always gone on a hike it just yeah. would have been very short next siege yes so the city of leningrad in russia no longer exists but not because of this siege you can probably guess why mm. the soviet union fell in 1991 and suddenly the name lenin a little less popular the hell you say leningrad is now saint petersburg named after a man called peter who i believe don't quote me on this might have been a, a holy man of some kind hmm yeah yeah, I have my doubts. I thought he was just named after a penis. Actually, St. Peter was one of the original 12 apostles, an OG of the Jesus crew. And in the mythology of the Bible, he is lauded as the longest serving pope of the Catholic Church. Oh, did we talk about him in like episode Shmamish Man? Probably. I don't yeah. know. None of this is historical. Okay. It's not verified, obviously. It was from the Bible. But what is verified is that the siege of Leningrad was so brutal that it has often been classified as a genocide and quite possibly was the costliest siege in history based on sheer loss of life and human suffering. This one's pretty brutal. Fun. The blockade of the city of 3 million people lasted some 900 days, so almost three years, and the toll on the citizens was epic. Okay. Starvation and exposure would result in the death of a third of the population, about a million people, and many of the survivors resorted to cannibalism. It starts, as many of the worst stories in history do, with Adolf Hitler. 
Hitler had signed a non-aggression treaty with Russia in 1939 while he aggressively battled the entirety of Europe. But the Russians were shocked. Shocked, I say. <laughs> Appalled! When, when barely two years after signing a non-aggression pact, Hitler turned around and invaded Russia. Damn motherfucker. This was the infamous and disastrous Operation Barbosa, which should have been called Operation Backstab or Operation Why the Hell Did You Trust Me in the First Place or Operation Not Well Thought Out. I mean, there's a fourth name, which, you know, is historically accurate, which is Operation... Oh, wait, Napoleon couldn't do it either. Yeah, Operation Don't Attack Russia in the Winter. Yeah. Most listeners are probably familiar with Hitler's biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. He was already fighting basically, you know, the world mm -hmm. on the Eastern Front. And by attacking Russia, he opened up the battle to both sides. So he was now fighting on two fronts. It was a power-hungry move and debatably the primary reason that he eventually lost the war. That's what a lot of people believe. Yeah, the beginning of the end, at least. But while the Germans did lose the war, they weren't the biggest losers when it comes to loss of life. The Soviet Union would suffer by far the most casualties of World War II. Some 15% of the Soviet population, or more than 20 million deaths due to starvation and bloodshed. Hitler viewed Leningrad as a symbol of communism, and he wanted to completely pound it to rubble. Right. This wasn't just a strategic acquisition of territory. This was not an annexation. Hitler wanted to make an example of Leningrad. In a memo, he wrote, quote, the Fuhrer has decided to erase the city of Petersburg from the face of the earth, unquote, admitting to the planned crime of genocide and also the horrific crime of referring to himself in the third person. <laughs> so annoying. Hard to decide which is worse. <laughs> there were actually more than two countries involved here. In 1941, the Germans encircled the city from the south, north, and west, while soldiers from Finland locked it up from the north, cutting off all supply routes and sealing the city. Yeah. If you actually ever want a, a sort of cool, not really historically accurate, but well-acted movie about this, Enemy at the Gates is a good one to watch. Really? Yeah. I don't want that at all. This is horrendous. Wait till we get to the, the carnage. It's basically just about a sniper battle. It oh. boils down to that. At first, the Germans approached the city and engaged in trench warfare, shelling the populace relentlessly from a distance, but Hitler quickly decided that he was wasting resources and settled on another tactic. He informed his generals that he would not be accepting the city's surrender because he didn't want to have to worry about feeding and sustaining the population. Instead, he would simply squeeze Leningrad to death like an anaconda, cutting off all resources and support and simply waiting for the entire three million to starve and die off. Yeah. The details of this siege are... Vicious. Like, it's hard for me to even talk about this, so this one's going to be short. Okay. The residents of Leningrad burned their furniture, they dismantled their houses for firewood. To survive, they ate wallpaper and lipstick and petroleum jelly. They boiled leather belts. They munched on dry grass and weeds. In science labs, they cultivated bacteria and drank vials of it for calories. Eey. From the Los Angeles Times, quote, cannibalism was so much a fact of everyday life that parents feared their children would be eaten if allowed out after dark. New documents show that the city police created an entire division to fight cannibals, and some 260 Leningraders were convicted of and jailed for the crime, unquote. And then at the end of the siege, there were only 10. 10 people in the jail because you just put a bunch of cannibals <laughs> in a fucking jail. <laughs> a well-fed 10. They were... Plump, rosy-cheeked. <laughs> A little they bit crazy. Just fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are pictures of it online if you're uh, into that. I'm, I'm kink shaming in my mind right now. Uh, loudly. Yeah. Is there not something that I want to look at? Certainly if you value your peace of mind. During that first winter, which became known as Hungry Winter, as many as 100,000 people a month were dying. The tide would finally turn in 1944 as the attackers were driven back from Russia and the city was freed or, you know, what was left of it. Right, don't fully recover from that, at least not in one generation. The zombie scape was freed, quote unquote. Fuck that forever. Well, it reminds no me of the Donner Party. Like you can get out of there, but you're haunted forever. You just, yeah. I mean, you might survive by eating, you know, dead children in the streets or whatever, but you have to live with that afterwards. Mm. I don't know if surviving is the best outcome. Right. Next siege. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move the fuck on. <laughs> Jesus. Even I was getting creeped out by that one. I've got a dark sense of humor. So are you familiar with the Punic Wars? Uh, no. They were a series of battles fought between Carthage and Rome, which would be roughly modern-day Spain versus Italy. And the primary aggressor against Rome was the Carthaginian general Hannibal, who is famous for leading an army equipped with war elephants on a frigid march through the Alps to attack Rome, one of the most famous uh, marches and military maneuvers of history. 
Yeah, it's, it's one of the more storied. Yeah, I actually am familiar with this now. I just didn't remember that punitive was part of it or something. I don't know. Punic, and yeah, it actually wasn't, so the elephants were later. Right. But uh, as a boy, Hannibal had sworn to his father that he would defeat the Roman Empire. Mm. So he had a lot to live up to. That's pretty heavy. If I believed every five-year-old was like, I'm going to be Mr. Mac. Yeah, no. Yeah, a lot is made of how he's like such a brilliant kid. It's just, I don't, That's not, you know what? Keep their expectations low and they'll never be disappointed. Seriously. If, if you start with, I'm overthrowing an empire, you're only hurting yourself because it's going to be real hard to argue that you can't find the motivation to clean your room. <laughs> <laughs> Finish your homework, Napoleon. <laughs> But Hannibal had a lot to live up to because his father was a famous and decorated Carthaginian general whose name was Hamilcar. I'm sorry. Say that again? Hamilcar Barca. Even better. So Hamilcar Barca had been a celebrated general during the First Punic War, the first of the three clashes between Rome and Carthage. But I don't know uh, what they were celebrating about him because, you know, he must have been successful to get as famous as he was, I guess. But there were two more Punic Wars, so he couldn't have been that successful. Yeah, and, you know, Rome stuck around for a bit, so he clearly didn't win. By the time of Hannibal's initial reign, the two empires had achieved a tenuous peace, Mm. but Hannibal had a promise to keep, and so he needed to find a pretext for war, and he found it in the city of Saguntum. Okay. Hamilcar of Barca at Saguntum. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell for clearing your throat. Or, you know, causing flatulence in your enemy, yes. Saguntum is modern-day Segunto in Spain and had been initially founded as a settlement known as Ars. A-R-S-E. I... really? I am assuming it meant something else back then. We've covered the fact that language is fluid. Mm. So you just kind of have to hope that the name of your city, you know, never ends up being slang for butthole or something. This Lick we- me in my Santa Cruz! <laughs> wonder how many people died and had, like, you know, John of Ars on their <laughs> tombstone. <laughs> It's a little less, a little less uh, moving than Joan of Arc. <laughs> Joan of Arc, meet John of Ars. Um, not gonna date him. Swipe left. So by 218 BC, the former Ars had become a fortified Spanish city that happened to be an ally of Rome, and it was located right on the edge of the Iberian territory controlled by Hannibal's father Hamilcar. Hannibal didn't feel that his Carthaginians would support him if he attacked Rome without provocation, but annexing a rogue city on the edge of his territory would be the perfect spark, because it would potentially drag the two empires into a second and hopefully decisive conflict. Hmm. Saguntum did call for Roman help, and the Romans helpfully declared war on Carthage, and then helpfully did not show up. What? They just waited around for Hannibal to finish sacking the city. Rome was like, Saguntum who? (laughs) You mean arse? (laughs) Fuck no. <laughs> I ain't have no damn arse. I ain't wiping no arse. You, know, you wipe your own arse. But even without Roman interference, the siege was not a cakewalk for Hannibal. The city was well defended by massive walls and expert javelin throwers, one of whom speared Hannibal from the top of the wall, and the Carthaginians had to put the siege on hold while he recovered. Wow. Yeah. Give that dude a medal. I like that they were just like, hey, hey, time out, guys. Okay, <laughs> not cool. All right. Game off. Came off. Uh, we, yeah, our general got one in the shoulder. We didn't realize you'd be out here spearing generals just willy nilly. That's. Wow. I don't know how you conduct yourselves here in Ars, <laughs> but in Carthage we only spear the poor people. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Show some decorum. Seriously, who does that? The Arsians, that's who. <laughs> Ars heads. I was just about to say, don't be an arsehole. Oh, Jeebus. The siege lasted eight long months before the fortifications finally crumbled. Quote, Hannibal offered to spare the population on the condition that they were willing to depart from Saguntum unarmed, each with two garments. And that they would leave that javelinist <laughs> out of the fucking city <laughs> tied to a rock. <laughs> Or maybe, you know what, it was a different time. Maybe he was just like, ah, fair play. <laughs> you caught me blinking. <laughs> you know, like, I was looking down trying to tie my boot and, you know, fuck. Like, right. Ah, you got me. <laughs> you sneaky <laughs> spear chucker, you. you. Sneaky son of a bitch. Yeah, right. Basically, he told them, you can leave if you grab, like, nothing other than two pairs of clothes. Get the fuck out. Grab your shit and go. The occupants of the city declined the offer and began to sabotage the town's wealth and possessions. They were burning everything. And as a result, every adult was put to death. Uh, That escalated quickly. Yeah, I'm not going to offer any kind of justification for the murder of an entire adult population of a city. Mm. 
But when your walls fall down and the invading general gives you the opportunity to leave with two garments, mm. two outfits in your life, that's not a bad deal when you lost a war. No, I, I feel that's fair play. You have your pajamas. You have some business casual. <laughs> your head is still attached to your body. Just it's your, time to go. Your organs are inside. <laughs> yeah. The fall of Saguntum marked the beginning of the Second Punic War, and Hannibal would go on to use the city as his base of operations before heading over the Alps. So there was probably elephant shit everywhere within, like, days. It was Again. a mess. Mm. Spoiler alert, he did not take down Rome. Weird. But he did have a very impressive march across some very impressive mountains. It was historic. Mm. Elephants were involved. It was also completely pointless. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately. Final siege. Not in history, but they, there will be more. There's one <laughs> nope. going on right now. Better go tell those people out there invading Ukraine... So we're going to end here in the Americas. Oh, fun. Back in the 1300s, a tribe of hunters and gatherers settled in what is now Mexico City and founded Tenochtitlan, mm. which would become the crown jewel of the Aztec Empire. Yes. By 1502, the empire extended as far north as modern-day Nicaragua and was ruled by Moctezuma II. Mm. However, many of the territories that had been conquered and annexed by the Aztecs were restless and chafing under increasing taxation and harsh treatment. Mm. So the potential for rebellion existed among the Aztec territories long before Hernan Cortes arrived, but the Spanish conquistador would leverage this popular discontent for his own benefit, subjugating the region and ultimately destroying the entire Aztec empire. That and disease, but yes. The common version of this story, you might have heard it, is the idea that the Aztecs believed the conquistadors were gods, specifically that Cortes was the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl, mm. who had been prophesied to make an appearance right around the same time. But there doesn't seem to be any agreement as to whether the Aztecs really believed that the Spaniards were gods, mm. or if it was just obvious that the conquistadors were foreign and dangerous and possessed advanced military technology. You yeah, know, rifles and heavy metal. Yeah, I'm not sure if this was a Ewoks and C-3PO situation, or if it was more just self-preservation. Right. Whatever the reason, Moctezuma invited Cortes into his inner sanctum in Tenochtitlan and did anoint him with the feathered serpent headdress. It seems clear at this point that the Aztecs were pursuing a strategy of appeasement, but the Spaniards were still very uh, nervous. Huh. They were hugely outnumbered, so eventually they became paranoid and they essentially took Moctezuma hostage. Cortes forced Moctezuma to publicly plead with the Aztecs for peace, and according to the Spaniards, Moctezuma was stoned to death by his own citizens. I feel these are lies. Eh, it's hard to say. Aztecs would claim that the Spaniards had murdered him, but he was kind of their only bargaining chip, so that doesn't really hold water either. Yeah. Either way, he was equally dead, and the Spanish were chased from the city. Mm. After an ill-advised full frontal attack, failed miserably, Cortes retreated, licked his wounds, and focused on shoring up allegiances with local tribes and Aztec states that favored revolution. Mm. Meanwhile, a lucky break for the Spanish decimated the Aztec population. While the conquistadors hadn't succeeded in conquering the capital through violence, what they lacked in military might, they made up for in filth and disease. <laughs> Being dirty Spanish bastards, yes. Smallpox was now raging through Tenochtitlan. The city was located on an island in Lake Texcoco, with dry access provided only by a series of causeways and various bridges that could be retracted. There were attacks and counterattacks. There were plots on Cortez's life. At one point, 65 Spaniards were captured alive and sacrificed dramatically to the gods. E. Quote, the dismal drum of Huichi Lobos sounded again. We saw our comrades who had been captured in Cortez's defeat being dragged up the steps to be sacrificed. Cutting open their chests, drew out their palpitating hearts, which they offered to the idols. The Indian butchers cut off their arms and legs. Then they ate their flesh with a sauce of peppers and tomatoes, throwing their trunks and entrails to the lions and tigers and serpents and snakes. Unquote. Yikes. Presumably finished off with a nice Chianti. Yes. <laughs> Some fava beans. So the Aztecs would eat another 70 hearts of captured Spanish prisoners during their bloody final stand, which culminated in their surrender on August 13th, 1521. Gotta get in those last snacks before you throw in the towel. <laughs> you get munchies, man. It's, it's hungry work. After 75 days of fighting and starvation, the Aztecs had been overrun by a fighting force that was mostly comprised of Native Americans, ironically. Cortez claimed that after the victory, his Native American allies ritually sacrificed over 15,000 of their Aztec rulers. Total deaths for this entire fiasco numbered between 100,000 and 240,000. 
of which Spanish losses were about 100. <laughs> or 1,800 if you include sickness and accidents. Spanish experienced many tragic twisted ankles and oh, Charlie guess. horses. <laughs> <laughs> the dumb fuck who slipped in the bathroom and brained himself is counted as a loss in this battle? What? It's a cruel irony that Cortez was able to conquer the city only due to his alliance with Native Americans, and yeah. that most of the slaughter was among indigenous people, but completely instigated by and puppeteered by the colonists. Right. There are no happy endings in life. Have we mentioned that before? This I is, think this is a reoccurring the theme world we is mentioned. A terrible place. And, <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. Fuck humans and <laughs> once again, you know, we finish on an up note. Well, we do have one up note. Huh? We have a new patron. Fuck yeah. Welcome Lori. Lori? Yeah. It's a, that's just such a simple screen yeah. name. <laughs> I know. This is no Bok Bok 64, <laughs> you know, Schmageggy Lakuga or whatever. It's just, yeah. just Lauren. Low maintenance. I dig it. And a quick review, Troy Lancaster, It's his name is Troy Lancaster High. Troy Lancaster High. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Troy Lancaster. It's Troy Lancaster, and it gives his current state of mind. He said, must listen, five stars, happy to find an informative yet hilarious podcast, appointment podcast. I like that. Oh, so he sets a date. Sorry, I was like, appointment podcast. We don't set, what, huh? Appointment podcast, it's like appointment television. It means uh, like you work your schedule around that thing because it's that important. Sorry, I, w I was born stupid and then I took lessons. So thank you, thank you for explaining. Thank you. Fair. <laughs> All right, Miffy folk. You know what I'm going to say. Why do I even bother? Why am I here? Go to the Instagram. Go to the Discord. And uh, otherwise, and forever after. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. Sleep is overrated.